So we are talking about power screws. So power screws, you can think about like they are the big brother for nut and bolt assembly, wherein you have a screw and then you have a thread that runs in a helical pattern. So this is a helix. And there is a nut. So this is the screw. This is the nut. And the, the purpose of this assembly is when you rotate this screw, the nut should advance or retract. So rotation of the screw results into translation of nut. Now I want to spend some time to give you a very fundamental understanding of this configuration. This is an assembly. This is a system wherein you have nut and you have screw. But if you think about the amount of power amplification or amount of force amplification that you get is very high. And I will tell you in just a second, force amplification Amplification is very high. And that is the reason why you probably have seen that you have sort of the toggle jacks that are used to lift the vehicle. So you have something like this and you have a toggle jack. So there is a nut here, there's a nut here. And what you do is you rotate using some sort of a lever and then the vehicle can go up or can go down. So usually this part is resting on the ground and this actually is supporting the chassis of the vehicle and as you rotate, it goes up and down. So if you think about it, if on your own, you try to lift the vehicle, your car, it's physically not possible. But with this type of assembly, the force amplification is very high. So what happens is usually you would have, either you rotate this screw, manually or you attach this to some sort of a motor or engine. And then this can be used to translate the nut and everything attached to that nut. So for an example, if you are looking at the lathe, lathe is a machine tool used for machining, then the tool post. So this could be a tool post. If it's a 3D printer, then this could be the rail of the 3D printer. So basically you would have X, Y, and Z axis. And if you look at the 3D printer, you would have power screws that move the entire uh, table in X and Y direction. And you will see uh, another power screw that will move the extruder in Z direction. So if you look at the paper motors that are used, that are very simple. So 
that actually is very small, but because of this very high uh, force amplification, a small motor can be used for uh, power to uh, design. And then you can have a large amplification. So the key question is, where are we gaining or losing? So question is, energy can either be created nor be destroyed. So how do we get this very high amplification? And what I want to tell you is I want to give you uh, two approaches for this. If you think about it, the power is equal to force times velocity. So if you think about the velocity of the nut, so I'm going to call this V, I'm going to call this F. On the nut, you have F and V. Power is also given as torque times the angular velocity. So this is torque multiplied by angular velocity. And this is power here. Torque times the angular velocity is the power of the motor, which is torque times omega. And F times V is the power of the nut. Energy can neither be created nor be destroyed. So these two powers, assuming 100% efficiency, they are equal, one and the same. However, advancement of nut, this is very important, advancement of nut in one revolution of a screw is equal to lead. So this lead is very small. What that means is the, the even, even if the angular velocity is large, even though omega is large, V is going to be low. Because V is omega multiplied by leaf. Omega is revolutions or uh, revolutions per second, or you can do it in uh, radians per second, and then once you multiply that by the lead in millimeter, you can get millimeter per second as the velocity. And you have on the other side, you have radians per second. So if you look at the overall structure, the torque, pro this is actually very important. So I'm gonna repeat this one more time. Torque provided by the motor is low but the speed of the motor is very high. So on the left-hand side of the power equation, if you look at the power delivered by motor, this power has two components. One is torque and other one is angular velocity. The torque provided by the motor is low, but the speed of the motor is very high, anywhere between 600 RPM to 1,200 RPM. On the other side of the spectrum, if you see the velocity of the nut, the velocity of the nut is low, but results into higher forces. So what we have is T times omega, this is on the motor side, is equal to F times V, this is on the nut side. This is on the nut side, this is on the motor side. So by manipulating, the values of omega and v, we are able to achieve the force amplification. And that's why the screw jack can lift the vehicle. That is the reason why you have this small stepper motor that can actually uh, drive uh, the 3D printer. 
and this is successfully used in lots and lots of amplification. So if you think about uh, a slide, then the size of the motor is typically small, but the speed of the motor is very high and that leads to the, uh, the force amplification. So energy or power which is energy per second can neither be created nor be destroyed. So the only thing that we have control over is the speed. And this is something similar to a gearbox. So for an example, initially when you are in the lower gear, the speed is low. So the torque is high. And as you go into the higher gear, torque decreases and speed increases. But in the case of uh, power screws, we are going from the rotary coordinate systems, which is torque and angular velocity, to the translational coordinate systems, which is nothing but force and the linear velocity. This is the fundamental principle of uh, power screw force amplification. And that is the reason why the power screws are used. At this point, let me ask you if you have any questions on the material discussed so far. If there are no questions, what I would like to do is I would like to go with the design of screw jack. Whenever you design the power screw, there are only few equations, couple of equations that are considered fundamental equations. And with those fundamental equations, you can pretty much design the entire screw. So what are the fundamental equations? So let me take an example. So if you have a screw, And there is this nut. And I'm going to show this nut is seated in a housing. So this is the nut and uh, screw assembly. Screw. Nut. Housing. And then you would have a lever. And what we will do is this lever will be rotated. And as you rotate the lever, this platform will be raised or lowered. So before I give you a step-by-step -step recipe for power screw design, let me just tell you what are the fundamental equations for power screw design. So on the screw, you are gonna have a load P. Depending upon the design, this load could be tensile or could be compressive. So I just want to tell you P is going to be the direct load on screw. Because of this direct load, you are gonna get either compressive stress or tensile stress. And the equation for that is load divided by area. So if I were to give you the tensile strength of the material, this is a material property.
if i say the material is made up with steel uh, you can find out the compressive and tensile strength for the steel if i say the material is maybe uh, uh, cast iron you can find the uh, the cam uh, the cast iron properties so this is something that you get from the design data book so this is from the data book p is the design criteria so they will say design a screw jack to lift the load of 10 kN and the only unknown that can be easily solved from this equation is the core diameter of the screw and then clearly you want to round it off on the higher side the next important equation so this is the very first equation that you will use next equation is as you rotate the screw there will be torque because if you think about it you are going to apply the force there is a lever arm l and clearly you need to do some work to raise or lower the load so the torque that is needed to lower or raise the load so torque that is needed to raise or lower the load is p times dm divided by 2 multiplied by tan of theta tan of alpha plus phi so what are these so dm is the mean diameter which is the core diameter plus outside diameter divided by 2 and once you find the core diameter from step 1 you can look at the design data book update the core diameter and you will find the the mean diameter however one thing i want to tell you if this information is not given to you you can approximate outside diameter somewhere 1.25 times the core diameter if that information is not readily available this is a fairly good approximation so when you find the torque you need to consider the mean diameter divided by 2 so this becomes like a radius next thing is what is this alpha and what is this phi alpha is the helix angle and phi is the friction angle so think about it and i want to give you this example say if my alpha helix angle is this and my friction angle so this is my helix angle alpha and say my friction angle is here since my alpha is greater than p the screw will not be self locking not self locking screw what does that mean in the case of a screw jack so i want you to think about this particular case so we are designing a screw jack and deliberately what we did is we had uh, we designed our helix angle greater than the friction angle what that means is if you were to have a plane that is oriented at angle alpha and if you place a box of any mass if you place a box of any mass on its own it will slide down 
once again i repeat so if you have alpha which is the helix angle and if you have phi which is the friction angle if the helix angle is greater than the friction angle then whatever you place on this plane on its own it would slide down what does that mean for a screw jack what it means in the case of screw jack if the helix angle is greater than the the friction angle on its own this uh, screw will drop down on its own the screw will drop down so it's not self locking so essentially you don't want to design a screw jack wherein as soon as you remove the torque because of the self weight it falls down and it actually hits the bottom however if you have a press so for an example let's visualize this a press application when you have a die and then you have this blank and you want to punch a hole through that blank in that case you want the screw to be not self locking because then on its own it will come down and punch a hole so for screw jack application you typically do not want non self locking so let me give you an example of what happens let's look at the example when alpha is less than phi so think about the value of alpha is less than value of phi this is phi this is alpha in this case if you have a block of mass m for this doesn't matter any mass this will be locked it will not slide on its own will not slide down on its own so c is greater than alpha and the screw is self locking the next thing what we want to do is with all this information we want to find out the value of torque which is given by p multiplied by dm by 2 tan in the parentheses alpha plus uh, phi and this torque is going to act on the screw so let's find out what are the torsional stresses what is the value of tau since torque is acting and power screw is like a shaft so since torque is acting we have to use the equation t divided by j multiplied by r t divided by pi by 4 uh, pi by 32 dc to the power 4 times dc divided by 2 that gives the value of torsional stress now here is the case on power screw direct stresses they could be tensile or compressive and shear stresses are acting simultaneously so they will give rise to principal stress and maximum shear stress so if you look at the equation sigma principal max is equal to 1/2 sigma 
plus square root of sigma square whole tau square and if you want to find out the maximum shear stress that is going to be one half sigma square plus four tau square so this is the maximum shear and this is the maximum principle now as you look at these uh, steps if you think about it they are sort of circular in the sense that you first find out the value of direct stress then you find the value of shear stress and then these two stresses get added and they should be less than uh, the the design strength of the material now well, how do we address this issue so the way to address this issue is when we find out the value of dc from this step when we find out the value of dc or core diameter from this step we would make it slightly bigger and i will take an example and i will discuss this so once we find the core diameter when we round it off we will round it off further so that when we get the values of sigma new sigma c or new sigma t and the values of the the tau based on the new uh, uh, dm the overall stress which is the maximum principal stress or maximum shear stress would be less than the design strength of the material so this should be less than sigma design this should be less than tau design the next step is to find the height of the nut so what is the height of the nut so height of the nut is basically this dimension so next step is height of the nut nut there are multiple ways you can find the height of the nut you can find the height of the nut based on the the shear failure you can find the height of the nut based on the the bearing failure but let me show you what type of failures are possible at the nut and the screw assembly so i'm going to show you the screw first so this is the screw and this is the nut and even though they are in tight contact with each other there is teeny tiny tolerance that dictates the type of fit that you have between the nut and the screw so this is screw and this is nut now if you think about the failure the failure could be the bearing failure and let's look at the bearing surfaces so you could have the first nut a helix you could have the second nut helix you can have the third nut helix so think about it like in terms of the helixes and then you are going to have a bearing surface i will try to show you here 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 you'll have a bearing surface here you will have a bearing surface here you will have a bearing surface here you will have a bearing surface here so if you think about it that this is the bearing surface for 
So sigma b is equal to p, which is the load that is acting pi by four b outside square minus b inside square multiplied by n, where n is the number of threads in contact. Now here, I just want to tell you an empirical rule. For any screwed joint to work, for any screw to work, properly, we need minimum three threads in complete engagement. And I have seen machines fail because this thumb rule was not followed. So whenever you are cutting a thread, the in the thread that is going in and the thread that is going out is not a complete thread. Because what happens is when you are cutting with a uh, maybe a thread cutting tool or if you are using a boring bar or any other material, the, the first thread that is at the inlet or at the entry point and the, the last thread which is exiting it's never complete. So you ignore those. Then what you do is you start with an assumption that you will have uh, one or two threads that would allow the screw for the engagement. Then two or more threads that will be at the end of the screw. And in addition to that, there should be three complete threads. So this is the assumption that you should take into account. And from here, we will find the height of nut. Is equal to the, the advancement, which is the pitch of the thread multiplied by number of threads. So this is the pitch. and number of threads. So going back, please note value of DO is known. Value of DI is known. Value of T is given to us. This value of Sigma B comes from the design data. The only unknown here is going to be N. And this value of n, you will substitute in number of threads. The pitch value would be known because once you find out the inside diameter and outside diameter of the screw, typically pitch is the difference between those two. Or you can actually use the design data table or design data book to find out the pitch. The next thing is, we want to check the nut for the uh, failure. So if you think about the failure, there is sheer failure possible. So what's gonna happen is think about it like, let me show you the type of failure. Check nut. For shear. So if you think about it, this is the nut. See the nut, and this could shear off here. So 
So imagine that you have nut and bolt assembly and you pull the nut and bolt uh, with a high load, then what happens is basically uh, uh, the, the threads get flattened. Essentially the threads fail and that is the shear failure. So for that, tau is equal to P divided by pi times d o times n multiplied by t. Now thickness of the screw is given as p by 2. So let me explain what this means. So this distance from here to here is the pitch. And this is the thickness. So thickness is equal to pitch divided by T. And that goes over here. Now, this is for nut. What happens with screw? Check. Screw for shear. Equation is going to be the same, but for screw, now I want you to think about and I'm showing an exaggerated view. So it's going to fail here. So please note, in the case of nut, the shear failure is on DO. And in the case of screw, the shear failure is on DI. So tau, this is for nut. This is for screw. P divided by pi di times n times t. So this is something important. Now, if the nut and the screw, they are made up with the same material, you can just check the screw for the shear and get done with it because then you would say that since the screw is safe, the nut is going to be safe. But if they are made up with different material, then you will have to check the screw separately and then you will have to check the nut separately. So I will add this note. If nut and screw are made up with same material just check the screw and why is that because di is lower the value of di is smaller than value of do any questions so far? Next part is we have to look at the nut collar design of nut collar. Now, how do we look at the design of nut collar. This nut collar design is based on the tearing failure of nut. So what that means is we are going to, let's 
Okay, let me show you what what do we mean by nut collar. So typically, the nut be like this. And here, we are going to have threads. So this is core diameter. This is outside diameter. These are the same dimensions for the screw. But this, I'm going to call this D1 which is the, the nut collar design. I mean, nut collar diameter. And this is T2, which is nut collar outer so to find that what we do is sigma tearing is equal to p divided by pi by 4 d1 square minus d o square. So in this equation, p is given to you, d o you found out, sigma tearing is given to you, or you can get it from uh, the design data book. The only unknown is d1. The next part to find d2, we have to find sigma crushing. P divided by pi by four, T two square minus T one square. And with that, we should be able to find out the inside and outside dimensions. But another important dimension is the thickness of this nut collar. I'm gonna call this T two. And this is found out using the circumferential shear. So this is tau pi times D1 multiplied by T2. So please note, in this equation, P is given to us. D1, we found out from the previous step. Crushing strength is designed given to us. So the only unknown is D2. Now here, we will substitute the value of D1 because if you look at the, the failure, the failure is occurring over here. Failure is occurring over here. So from this is known, this is known, this is known, this is known. So you can find out the value of D2. Any questions about the, the process so far?
Now the next thing is we want to find out the torque on the the handle and the length of the handle. So here is something that I want to talk about. And I gave you sort of a basic idea earlier on I mean, how do you design when you design the clutches? So let's think about what's going on here. So we have a nut. There is a screw that goes to the nut. And we want to rotate the screw. So there will be some sort of a handle and this handle needs to be rotated. Uh, only then we would be able to raise or lower the cup. But in this configuration, unless the nut is fixed to the housing by some means, so the way it is typically done is using a set screw. So you would have something like a set screw that will go to this and basically there is a screw that will hold the nut attached to the housing. This housing is placed on the ground. So you will, the nut will be held together with the housing and now you if you rotate the screw screw will go up and down this is the difference between the lead screw and the screw jack in the case of a lead screw the screw is rotating but the nut slides forward or backward so a quick uh, recap this in this case if you have a power screw the electric motor and the screw, they are not moving forward or backward. They will be stationary. That will cause this nut to go forward or backward. In the case of a screw jack, the nut is going to be stationary, which means the rotation of the screw will advance or retract uh, the screw itself and the load will be raised or lowered. So this is a difference uh, between the lead screw and the, the screw jack. Now what we need to do is we want to find out the amount of torque that we need to apply the, the, to this handle so that the screw can go up or down. And this torque is given by T, which is given as mu times the load P multiplied by the average radius. So where R is the radius and this radius is nothing but the outside radius minus the inside radius. So if you think about it, this is the outside radius. And this is the inside radius. P is the load. R average is equal to Ri plus Ro divided by two. And this mu could be different. This mu is the coefficient of friction wherein the materials that are in contact are here. So this mu could be different. If it is not given to us, then we can assume that to be 0 0.3. And that should be able to give us the amount of torque that needs to be applied to uh, raise or lower. And then once we know the torque, uh, we have to look at 
what type of application is this uh, system going to be used for? So if you're, it's just a manual application, which means you are not going to add a motor or anything, then typically human beings can supply 300 to 400 Newtons of force by hand, which is uh, like in a burst, in a burst mode. Continuous is less. And I just want to give you some uh, empirical understanding to it. So think about that if you want 300 to 400 Newtons is nothing but think about it like you are lifting 30 kilograms of load or 60 pounds of load. And it's just possible to apply for usual uh, the human beings to apply a burst force of 300 to 400 kilo newton, 400 newton. But for continuous, it will be anywhere between 100 to 150. So assuming that you are going to go push it or apply a burst sort of force, then you can assume you can apply 300 to 400 Newton of force. But if it is to be continuous, then you will be applying, or if you are gonna look at intermittent, uh, this is okay, but continuous would be somewhere between 100 to 150. So I need to say here, burst mode or intermittent. And 100, to 150 Newton of force continuous. So once you find out the force, once you know the torque, you can find out the length of the handle. Is equal to torque divided by the force. Torque usually would be in Newton meter. The force will be in Newton. So length of the handle will be given in meters. The last step, sometimes it is carried out for long screw jacks or tall jacks. This step is optional. So this is optional step. So think about it, I'm gonna draw a screw jack. If your screw jack is something like this, clearly something is not right with this concept because the length of the screw is significantly larger. This length is greater than the diameter of the screw. And this is not desired. So this is not desired. Because what happens is when you apply the force, this screw can actually buckle. What would happen to this screw is this screw will deform. And this would actually become like this. So buckling. So typically the L to D ratios are not large, but if you are going to <clears throat> design the screw jack that is used for particular applications such as these, you want to find out the critical load of buckling. So effective length, is given as lift of the screw plus height of the nut by two. 
and the buckling load is equal to AC sigma y 1 minus sigma y 4 c pi square e l by k square where k is the radius of gyration sigma y is the yield stress c is the end condition constant So typically the value of C is 0 0.25 because we assume one end to be fixed, other end to be free. K is the radius of gyration, which is 0 0.25 times DC. And E is the Young's modulus. And with AC is the area, which is pi by 4 dc square. So substitute these values and find the value of the buckling load. This buckling load should be greater than the load that is applied. So P, the design load that we started with, this buckling load should be greater than the load we applied. This, these are pretty much steps for the screw jack design. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give you a break of uh, 15 minutes. And we will come back and I will work out a problem on the screw jack. And then we will move on to the next lesson. Uh, any questions at this point? I'm going to pause recording and then I will we'll be back after 15 minutes. Okay, so the problem goes something like this. Design a screw jack. to lift 80 kilonewtons at the height of 400 millimeter. For the screw, the tensile strength is equal to compressive strength is equal to 200 megapascals, which is 200 Newton per millimeter square. Shear stress is 120 Newton per millimeter square. This is for screw. For nut, nut is made up with prosper bronze. And for that, sigma T is equal to 100 Newton per millimeter square. Sigma C is equal to 90 Newton per millimeter square. And tau is equal to 80 Newton per millimeter square.
then the bearing pressure or the bearing strength sigma b which is bearing is equal to 18 newton per millimeter square and we have to design the screw jack So this problem is a fairly straightforward problem like the way we solved before. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work out the problem using the steps uh, that we discussed earlier. Step one, design of screw. So here, I'm gonna assume a factor of safety is equal to two. This assume. Even though it is not required, it's a good idea to assume. Because we are finally going to design for the principal stresses. That is where this assumption would help us. So, sigma c, p, pi by four, pc square. Now, as you can see, the value of sigma c is 200. So 200, divided by the factor of safety is equal to 80 10 to the power 3 pi by 4 times the dc square and that gives us value of dc to be 33 millimeters if you look at the design data book you wouldn't find uh, diameter to be 33. You will see the diameter to be 34 or 36. Now at this point, I want to take a minute to think about what we are gonna do next. This is the rough calculation. So this is an estimate. It's a good idea to round it off to a much higher side because then your principal stresses would be within the limits. So what I'm gonna do is, and again, uh, it's just an empirical analysis. So I'm gonna assume 38 millimeter for safe principal stress design. So we have rounded it off to 38 millimeter. With the 38 millimeter DC, outside diameter DO is equal to 46 millimeter. And the standard pitch is eight millimeters. If design data book is not available, you can assume DO is equal to 1.25 times DC and the pitch is equal to DO minus DC. If data book not available. These are the approximate proportions for the screw. With this, I can find out the mean diameter.
So DI is nothing but DC. DO is 46 plus 38 divided by two. That gives me 42 millimeter. Now, at this point, we do not know uh, what should be the value of alpha. But this can be found out using the information that is given here. We know the value of the pitch. We know the value of the mean diameter. So if you think about it, this is the pitch, assuming single starts screw. And this is pi times dm. So this angle alpha is equal to tan inverse of eight divided by pi times 42. Or tan alpha is equal to eight divided by pi times 42. And that value uh, is 0 0.06. Now we don't know what is the value of coefficient of friction, but I'm gonna assume lubricated joint nut and screw assembly. And I'm gonna use a coefficient of friction at 0 0.15. So what I would do is I'm gonna find out the value of torque is equal to load P times dm by two multiplied by tan of alpha plus P. So, once you substitute this value here, you can find out the value of the torque. And the value of the torque is 340, 10 to power three Newton millimeter. So this is the torque that is to be applied so that the the screw can move up or down. Now the next part is, let's find out the direct load or direct stress P five by four B square. Now please recognize what we have done is we use the exact same equation to find out a rough value of DC. And we use that as a guideline and modified it. So now what we need to do is, we need to use the modified value of DC, not the original value. So that is going to be 80, 10 to power three, pi by four, DC is 38 square. That gives you 70 Newton per millimeter square. Now we want to find out the shear stress tau. Equation is T divided by J multiplied by R. 
value of torque is known 340 pi by 32 and you have to use the value of dc which is 38 to the power 4 which is about 31 newton per millimeter square and with that we should be able to find out the maximum principal stress that is one half sigma c four times 31 square. And once you solve this, this comes around 82 Newton per millimeter square. And this 82 is significantly less than 100 for design is safe. Any questions here? We will find out the maximum shear stress. One half. Sigma C squared. Sigma C. We got here which is 70 31 and that value is 47 newton per millimeter square if you look at the design data tau is 120 newton per millimeter square assuming the factor of safety of two using same assuming same factor of safety it's 120 divided by two 60 so this tau max is significantly less than the design stress Next step, is we need to find out the nut dimensions. So for nut dimensions, we are going to use the bearing pressure. Sigma B, so nut height. Sigma B is 18, P e is 80, 10 to the power 3, So with this value of N is equal to 8.3. So what we are gonna do is, again, this 8.3 is greater than three. So that's good. So we will have full engagement, adding two nuts, one for in entry and one for exit. We are gonna say the total number of threads is equal to 10. So once we have number of threads is equal to 10, 
the height of the nut P times N P which is the pitch 8 millimeters multiplied by 10 80 millimeters. Now we want to find out the shear stresses in the screw and shear stresses in the nut. P pi times N times DC multiplied by T. 80 10 to the power 3 pi 10 38 and the value of p is p divided by 2 so which is 8 by 2 so t is equal to pitch divided by 2 and that gives me 16.1 Newton per millimeter square. Similarly, we will do the same thing for tau nut T divided by pi N T O T 80 10 to the power 3 T O is 46, 46 multiplied by 8 by 2 and that gives you 13.8. Now please note in this problem since the nut is made up with prosper bronze and screw is made up with steel, we had to do these two calculations to find out the values differently. If both of them would have been like uh, steel, then you just find out the value for the screw. And as long as it is less than the design stress, your design should be okay. The next process, uh, the next step, is we have to find out the outside and inside dimensions of the nut. So this is step, step four. Nut dimensions. D1 is the outer diameter. And D2 is outside diameter of the nut. A quick recap. So we are trying to find out these dimensions. This is outer. And this is outside. So sigma t is equal to p divided by pi by 4 d1 square, this is d1, where p is 80 D1 is not known D O is 46 square 
and with that we can sigma uh, sigma c is the value uh, that we already have which is 100 divided by 2 where 2 is the factor of safety and that should give me the value of d1 value of d1 is 65 millimeters next part is to find d2 consider the crushing the sigma t this is tier this is crushing is D2. Again, substituting the values. Et times 10 to the power 3 five by four d2 square minus d1 is already known and with that we get 82 millimeters the next step we need to find out this collar thickness d2 Tau is equal to P pi D1 T2 tau value again using the same factor of safety D1 is 65, T2, so from here, T2, 100, just a second. This came from this value. Sigma T. Okay. So this is tier. This compression or crushing. Okay. So with this T two is equal to 10 millimeter. Now, next step is to find out the torque and the design of handle. So step five. So again, there is some empirical relations that we have to uh, uh, look at, but main dimensions are determined already. So let, let's sketch those. And this is where the screw is gonna go. Okay. 
and this is where the cup now this is sort of an empirical relation so what we are going to do is we are going to assume our outside is equal to do multiplied by uh, 1.75 do by 2 multiplied by 1.75 and our inside so is equal to so if you are the pin diameter here which has to be a little bit less than the screw diameter so i'm gonna assume this is just an assumption is 10 millimeter assume this is also assume so you get r outside so torque, friction torque is equal to one half times mu times W. R outside plus R inside divided by two. Value of mu, you can consider to be 0 0.25 and substitute these values and you will get approximately 320 newton meters so 320 multiplied by 10 to the power 3 newton per millimeter so the total torque is frictional torque plus torque to raise the load. So we are going to add these two together. So frictional torque is 321 plus load, the torque to raise is 340. And assuming, assuming force applied is equal to say 300 Newtons, the length of the handle is equal to 321 plus 340, 10 to the power 3, divided by 300. So, which is about 2200 two, zero, zero millimeter. Now, some of you may say this looks very long handle, and that is true. And the reason for that is so the screw jack could have a handle which extends on both the sides. So overall handle, it just is not only on one side, but this overall length could be 2200. And the reason for that is this is a manual operation operated screw jack. You can certainly add some sort of uh, motor or gear assembly and automate 
this raising and lowering uh, of the speed jack. The next part is optional that you can actually design the screw jack uh, for the buckling, see if the screw jack can buckle. The last part is design of body, which means if you want to consider the housing part, this is the nut, and this is the body. So once you have sketched the nut and the screw, you wanna add the body to it so that it's properly housed and protected. There is no engineering calculation for housing uh, body design, but you have to make sure that the body is proportionate and able to support uh, the load. With this, we finish screw jack design. And let me ask you if you have any questions. Any questions so far? Okay, then what we are gonna do is I'm gonna go and look at another important design aspect, which is design of springs. Um, but before I do that, let me look at the assignments that are due. So any questions on homework three? In homework three, you have to design a shaft and a flange coupling. Uh, and then you have to design any questions on flange coupling with Homework three. This problem is similar to the one that worked out in the lectures and also uh, in the uh, textbook. So the next part, which is kind of uh, interesting, is the design of springs. Let me discuss the design of springs, and then I will move on to the, the design of gears. So next topic is design of springs. So there are two types of springs. One is the helical spring. These are commonly used, helical springs. And they are commonly something like this. So 
and then you have leaf springs. So if you look at the automotive suspension system, you can see the different combinations. So sometimes you have air suspension, so you have air springs, you have helical springs, you have leaf springs, and the combinations of these. In helical springs, you have compression spring, and you have the tension spring. So it depends upon what type of loads are supported by the different spring types. And the springs are designed, we talked about it earlier, on the basis of torsion. So let me set up the problem. So we are gonna talk about design of uh, helical springs. So what are the applications? So typical applications are to store energy to exert force to absorb shocks to major forces, for an example, spring balance, and to change vibration characteristics. So this is a typical application of an isolator. Shock absorbers are commonly used in automotive applications. So let's look at the important dimension or how is the geometry of a helical spring. If you look at the helical spring, the helical spring is going to look something like this. The word helical comes from the helix because it's a wire that is wound in a helical pattern. So if you see, This is how the helical spring is going to look like. There will be a load P over here, same load will be applied over here. And there are two important dimensions. One is the diameter of the coil. And second one is diameter of the wire. So wire is small d, coil is capital D. The wire diameter. This is coil diameter. And the ratio of wire diameter to coil diameter is an important design parameter. That is called as C. 
sometimes it is referred as spring index. Another important property of the spring is spring rate, which is the, the, the ratio of force to displacement. So this is force, this is displacement. And if it's a linear spring, K is force, divided by delta. Force divided by displacement gives you the spring rate. The unit for spring rate, K, is Newton per meter. Now, what we want to do is we want to derive the equation for the, uh, the total stresses on the helical spring. So, if you look at and I want you to think about this a little bit. There is this load P. This load P is going to add a direct load. So this is going to give you a direct stress. But if you think about the load P, load P is acting at distance D by two. So what it's going to do is it's going to apply torsional stress. Because since this P is at the distance D by two, you are gonna have the, the torque P times D by two that is going to twist the spring. So we are gonna find out the total stresses on the helical spring. is equal to sigma direct plus torsional. So sigma direct is P divided by pi by four D square. And torsional stress is T divided by J multiplied by R. P pi by four D square plus P times D by two, which is torque. So I have to be careful, this is T. Multiplied by R, which is small D by two, and J is pi D raised to four by 32. So now when you simplify this, you are gonna get this equation, which is sigma so this is actually, I need to say tau direct shear. And this is torsional shear. So this is gonna become eight times P times D by D cube one plus D by two D. So this, and I should write this equation down as sigma and tau, tau total, tau total, is equal to eight T D by D cube one plus one divided by two C, where C is equal to D by T. So C is the design parameter, which is the ratio of the, the coil diameter to the wire diameter. And with this formula, we should be able to find out the value of 
tau total, which is the total shear stress, which has to be less than tau design. But please understand that this analysis is based on two dimensions. In other words, we are ignoring the effect of three dimension geometry. So we are ignoring 3D geometry and effect of curvature. So this equation can be modified to incorporate the, the geometry and curvature factor. And that is given as something called as the Wals factor. So what we can do is this equation can be modified to use a factor K. And I'm gonna call this equation factor K. And this K is given as 4C minus one, 4C minus four plus 0 0.615 divided by C. This is called as the Wals factor. Why do we need this Wals factor? We need Wals factor because the equation that we derived is derived based on the mechanics of material uh, equations in two dimensions. But if you were to look at the spring, the spring is actually in the three dimensions. So what that means is this equation is not going to give us super accurate results. And that to take that into account, we add this Wals factor that would compensate for the approximate calculations. And many a times in the design problem, uh, it will be specified. Say for an example, consider Wals factor or don't consider Wals factor. And I will work out the problem where Wals factor is considered and Wals factor is not considered. And then we will actually work out the problem. The next important equation for spring design I'm not going to derive this equation, but I'm going to tell you the equation. This is deflection of the spring. Is equal to 64 P R cube N divided by GD is to four, where R is the coil radius N is number of turns P is the force G is modulus of rigidity and D is the wire diameter. And please understand spring design is based on the torsion. So the concept that we studied in the case of torsion are used to find out the total stresses in the spring. So that's why we have modulus of rigidity which is torsional stress divided by torsional strain. Torsional stress divided by torsional strain. Okay, now let me work out a problem and the things to be clear. But last but not least, sometimes we have to find the length of the spring and the equation is very simple. If you think about the spring, 
string is something like this. So you have number of, so this is the diameter. So length of the string. is equal to number of turns multiplied by the diameter of the coil plus n minus one multiplied by a clearance which is about one millimeter plus delta max so this is the clearance So this, are, this is the basic procedure for spring design. Uh, are there any questions? Can I work out a problem? So let me uh, solve, let's start the simple problem. Design a helical spring for max load P is equal to thousand newtons. Deflection. is equal to 25 millimeters. Spring index, so this is important. Spring index is equal to D divided by D is equal to five. And tau S, which is, the, it's a spring steel. So shear stress is very high. So spring steel, spring steel have, uh, spring steels have higher uh, pump cutting up shear stress than the normal stress. Then the modulus of rigidity and in this problem, they are saying consider Wall's factor is equal to K is equal to four C minus one, four C minus four, zero point six one five divided by C. So wall factor is given to us. So first for this configuration, let's find out what is the value of the wall factor. And this wall factor only depends upon the ratio of coil diameter to wire diameter. So K, Four times five minus one. Four times five minus four. Zero point six one five divided by four. And this is one point three four. Now tau design is equal to eight. P D I D Q K eight times thousand times since D over D is five capital D is five times small D. So 
So from here, you can find out the value of D that is seven millimeter. So with this, we should be able to find out the capital D, which is five times seven, 35 millimeters, outside diameter, which is 35 plus seven, 42 millimeters, and inside dimension, which is little d minus d, 35 minus seven, 28 millimeters. Now to find number of turns, the information about the deflection of the spring is given. So spring deflection is given to find delta 64 P R cube N divided by G D is to four. Delta is 25, 64, P e is 1000, 35 by two, Q, So solve this equation and you get n is equal to 15. And that can be modified to 16. So number of turns are 16. And the length of the spring n times d plus n minus one clearance plus delta max. So 16 multiplied by seven plus 15 plus 25, which is 152 millimeter. So this is how you will solve the problem. Now, let me take a slightly different problem. So, design a spring for a spring balance. So design a spring for spring balance that is supposed to elongate. So the spring should elongate one twenty millimeters when subjected. to load of 300 newtons. Determine the wire dia and number of active turns. So the stress tau design, since it's a spring steel, 420 Newton per millimeter square, G is equal to 84,000 Newton per millimeter square. Consider effect of curvature. 
So when someone says consider the effect of curvature, that is an indication use Wall's factor. So to solve this problem, we have to find out Wall's factor K, which is given by 4C minus 1, 4C minus 4 plus 0 0.615 divided by C. So here, the spring index, they have given the spring index as well, this is all factor with spring index. Is capital D by D is equal to six. So four times six minus one, four times six minus four, one point two five. And tau is equal to eight PD pi d cube multiplied by the Wall's factor k. So this equation is 420 is equal to 8 times 300 times 6 d. Please note, there is a small d, not the capital D. This is 6 times d is equal to d. Pi d cube multiplied by k is 1.25. So from here, d is equal to four millimeters. Capital D, four times six, 24 millimeter. Do is 24 plus four, 28. And di is 24 minus four equal to 20. So these are the dimensions. And in case if you want to sketch the spring, Four millimeter this is twenty eight millimeter this is twenty millimeters and the next part is to find the the number of turns. Delta sixty four P R cube N divided by G D raised to four. Value of delta is given to us one twenty is equal to sixty four multiplied by P is three hundred R is twenty four by two because twenty four is the diameter multiplied by N divided by 84,000. And please note that the units, they have to be consistent. You cannot have uh, millimeters and meters interchanging. Once you solve this, N you will get at 78. So number of turns is equal to 78 turns. Any questions here?
So the next part, which I want to talk about, is design of leaf spring. So let me show you leaf spring. How are these leaf springs made? So basically, as the word says, leaf spring. So you have a metallic piece. It's a small plate. Under metallic plate is stacked on top and bottom. But if you look at the way these plates are, the length of these plates decreases as you go down. To hold these plates together, you have a central bolt. And then here, there is something called as an eye. So this eye is attached to the chassis. And this bottom part is attached to the axle. So what happens is the disturbance because of the road that goes to the axle gets transmitted to the spring. And this is where the characteristics are changed. And then uh, assuming the spring is properly tuned, that is damped. The, the disturbance is damped. So you get a comfortable ride. Now here is, there are two procedures for design of leaf spring. And you can actually use any of this process. It, uh, it's not necessary that you use one particular process. And the answer that you will get from the spring design uh, would be the same. You would also see some variations in the spring designs. So sometimes in addition to these leaves, you have two clamping bolts. So there is one clamping bolt on one side, the other clamping bolt on the other side. So you have bolt here. And you have bolt here. And these bolts are basically U bolts. And there are bands, clip bands. Like these clip bands hold these springs together. So if you look at the design of this spring, let me give you the process. Design of leaf spring. First, determine strength of each leaf. And this is purely designed based on the bending. We are gonna call this M, which is F by Y multiplied by I. An assumption here is approximate cross section is known. Next step is determine 
number of leaves which is n and that is given as n is equal to the maximum bending moment divided by m so what we are doing is we are in theory trying to find out what is the maximum bending stress or what what is the maximum bending moment each leaf can support so this is sort of the bending moment per leaf and then we take this and use this to divide the maximum bending moment that gives us the number of leaves next step is determine radius of curvature you will never find a flat leaf spring typically they have some curvature and the equation on curvature is m divided by i is equal to f upon y is equal to e upon r which is the bending equation so that radius of curvature r is e times i divided by m the i is the moment of inertia e is young's modulus and m is the bending moment and the last but not least is center deflection is l square divided by e r and uh, let me uh, give you the second procedure and then we will work out few problems but i'm going to give you a break of 15 minutes after the break i will discuss the second procedure and solve the problem so break for 15 minutes okay let me look at the second process to find out uh, the dimensions of the leaf spring and depending upon what data is available you can choose uh either of those techniques in second process or second technique so this is method 2 so here we find out b to t ratio so find b to t ratio for each leaf now where b is equal to the breadth t is the thickness so if you have this leaf spring this b this t then determine effective length which 
is L minus central band width where L is the length of the leaf minus the central band width. Now, this in this process, we equate maximum bending stress on full length leaf to safe bending stress or design stress. And that gives us the value of T. So for bending moment, if you look at the leaf spring, typically it's a simply supported beam. So bending moment is W, which is the load multiplied by L divided by force. Total number of leaves are grad NG plus NF. So this needs little discussion. If you look at a leaf string, typically the top few leaves are full length leaves because they are the longer leaves. But the, as you go towards the bottom, the leaves become shorter. So the top leaves are considered as full length leaves and the bottom leaves are considered graduated leaves. And then we use this equation, sigma b is equal to 18 times m divided by bt square two times graduated leaves plus three times full length leaves and equate it to sigma b safe. And with this equation, we find b knowing t by t ratio. So again, this process also asks you to go forward and backward a little bit, a little bit back and forth to come up with the design calculations. So what I'm gonna do is quickly, I'm gonna work out uh, a problem. So problem, a semi-elliptical laminate spring is 90, 900 millimeter long and 55 millimeter wide. Held together with a central band. Uh, which is 50 millimeter uh, wide. So, assuming thickness of the leaf five millimeter 
load applied forty five hundred newton and sigma max is equal to four ninety newton per millimeter square. Find number of leaves. So solve this problem. Start with L. Nine hundred millimeters. Uh, we have to use the central band correction. So bending moment will be W L minus. This is to correct for the band. So four ninety. multiplied by fifty five so four sorry forty five hundred w is forty five hundred forty five hundred nine hundred minus fifty divided by four this is the effective moment that is applied on all the leaves and strength of each leaf m is equal to 490 times 55 times 5 cube by 12 divided by 5 by 2 so this is the step we are using procedure 1 so we are finding out the value of m and we are finding out the maximum bending moment and then finding out the number of leaves. This gives me 102.2 Newton millimeter. So capital M divided by small m, the answer is 8.5, which is nine leaves. You can't have a fractional leaf or it would be nine leaves. So this is just a simple problem where most of the data is given to us. We just plug in the numbers. Now let me take sort of a design problem. Carriage, carriage leaf spring has ten leaves, each ninety millimeters wide, and support are and supports are 1 meter apart. It carries central load of 12 kilo Newton. Determine thickness of each spring. If sigma bending is equal to 540 Newton per millimeter square and find central deflection. Where Young's modulus E is 2.1, 10 to the power 3 Newton per millimeter square. So step one, we are going to find, we are going to assume T 
as the thickness of each leaf. Strength of each leaf. is equal to n f times i divided by y which is 540 this comes from here multiplied by i value is 80 times t cube by 12 divided by y is t by 2 number of leaves is equal to capital M divided by small m which is WL by 4 M. Please note in this problem, they are not asking us to do any corrections. So I would just use the values that are given here. divided by this, my answer is 7200 T square. And once I solve this, I get the value of T. is equal to because this number of leaves is equal to 10. So is equal to 10. So T is equal to 6.45 millimeters, so which is seven. Thus radius of curvature is equal to E times I divided by M, which is 2.1, 10 to the power five times 10, 80, seven cube by 12 divided by 1,200 multiplied by 1,000 divided by four. That gives us 1,600 millimeters. Now in the next part, we have to find out the center deflection. Center deflection is L square divided by 8R, which is 1,000 square divided by 8, 1,600 which is 78.1 millimeter. This would be the deflection of the center. Okay, any questions here? So in today's class, what we did, we started the screw jack. We studied the screw jack, we looked at the screw jack design, then we looked at the helical spring design, worked out a few problems on the helical spring design, and finally we looked at the leaf spring design. In the next class, we are going to start with design of gears. But I just want to set the stage for the gear design. So think about if you have two wheels, you have one big wheel and one small wheel. So depending upon the ratio of diameters, the speeds are going to be different, the angular speeds. So this is the big wheel. So I'm gonna call this wheel one. I'm gonna call this wheel two. As long as wheel one and wheel two are in close contact, and that close contact is maintained, this point P, which is 
the point where these two wheels interact, it can be considered on wheel one or wheel two. So you can consider point P on wheel one. which is same as point P on wheel two. This point P must have the same velocity, whether you considered on wheel one or wheel two, it has to have same velocity. If it has different velocities, considering whether it's on wheel one or wheel two, that means that point is going to break. The wheel is not maintaining the uniform and continuous contact. So I'm gonna call the speed of the first wheel as omega one, speed of the second wheel as omega two. I'm gonna call the radius of wheel one as R1. I'm gonna call radius of wheel two as R2. As you know, V is equal to omega times R. So VP1 point P considered on wheel one is omega one, times R1, point P considered on wheel two is omega two times R2, which means this gives me the gearing ratio, which is W2 divided by W1 is equal to R1 divided by R2. So what that means, if the, if the radius of wheel one, if R1 is two times R2, one revolution of wheel one will result into two revolutions of wheel two, which means the, the gear ratio, which is, or, which is called as R, which is given as two or reduction ratio. Now, next thing what I want to talk about is an important concept. I want you to pay attention. So this is called as the law of gearing. For a smooth and continuous power transmission, point of contact, must lie on line of centers. What that means is if you have a two, if you have two friction wheels or two gears, then this is the point of contact. If you were to draw the line through the, the centers, this is the center line, then the point where both these connect or come into contact with each other must lie on the line of center. And for a hypothetical case, just think about if this point is not on the line of center, the gear transmission is not going to be smooth or continuous. The power transmission is not going to be continuous. In other words, what is going to happen, this is important, that this big gear is going to exert a force on the small gear and small gear is going to exert the force onto big gear. This is FG and this is FS. And if you think about the reason the gears would maintain the contact is because there's a frictional surface. If you think about the friction wheels, and we are talking about friction wheels. You, the torque capacity of the friction wheel is mu times the normal reaction F multiplied by the radius is torque transmission capacity. It's coefficient of friction. This is normal reaction and this is radius.
So what we can do is we can use the same equation to derive the relationship between the torques. So in other words, what I can do is torque of gear one multiplied by the speed of gear one is the power, same power is torque of gear two is speed of gear two, which means T1 divided by T2 is equal to omega two divided by omega one. And if you look at omega two divided by omega one is equal to R1 divided by R2. So you have R1 divided by R2. Now, what does that mean? And I will repeat this once again next time when I start, but what it means is the normal reaction is going to be the, the same. In other words, T1 divided by R1 is equal to T2 divided by R2 is equal to Fg is equal to Fs. And this condition must be satisfied for smooth power transmission. If this condition is not satisfied, you will have wobbly gear transmission or gears making a lot of noise or simply the transmission will not function or efficiency will drop down. Uh, I'm gonna stop here. I will again touch upon law of gearing next class. And then um, in the earlier part of the class, we will talk about the spur gear design and the later part, I will talk about the helical gear design. I'm going to stop here today. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer.